Link, thanks for joining us today. Thrilled to have you here. First question, talk to me about what the Retin Link brand is. How do you stand out on, in this sea of creators, influencers, all the platforms? Well, our brand is called Mythical because when we met, which was the first day of first grade, we were both held in from recess for writing nasty words on our desks. And our uh, teacher told us that we had to color pictures of mythical beasts. So that origin story is what our fans picked up on. They started calling themselves mythical beasts. So then we called our company mythical. And when we launched our talk show, Good Mythical Morning, well, we knew we had to add a word mythical. Yeah, we have, we've got to have mythical in everything. And it's, it's cool. It can be a little bit confusing. People think that it means uh, fictitious, not real. We're really doing our best to rebrand mythical uh, because we are real. And <laughs> we have been friends forever, which I think that is the thing that sets us apart. And it's, it's the thing you can't control. It's like when people find out, they're like, are you, did you really meet in 1984 and you're still best friends and you still work together and you still enjoy each other's company? But you can kind of control your friends. I mean... I choose every day to still be your friend. And since some right. days are harder than yeah. others to make that. And you also try to control me. I do. Yes. <laughs> Out of all the other digital content, what do you guys stand for? What do people tune in to see? We're all about creativity, community, comedy. And I think that uh, there is, a, our friendship is kind of the core of where everything is built, right? So I think that there is this bond that the two of us have that, you know, we were just trying to create things to make people laugh. But what we ended up finding is that a, a lot of what the appeal was is people just wanted to be this, the third friend in this duo, right? So when you, when you hang out with us, you know, we speak directly to an individual person when we do our show. Uh, because we're inviting you to, hey, come and be a part of this friend group. We're just, we're, we're hanging out. So I think that... You. Yeah. We talk to you. That's a vibe. And who is this person? Who is the youth? Do you have like a, a nickname for that person? Do you picture them in their in your head? Is it a certain demographic? Who is the third the the, the third leg to this of the stool here? I I try not to be specific when I picture that one person, but somebody who's willing to hang out with both of us for many, many hours for over two thousand episodes. So it's someone who has a lot of patience mm. and has a very interesting taste in comedy growing up were you two like the class clowns they had to separate you make yeah sure they make, make sure they were in different classes because you're going to disrupt the whole the whole thing well our town was too small for there to be two classes oh that's very small uh so they just kind of separated us you know in other sides of the room yeah proximity in the class uh but yeah i think that is where it started you know when we began to see oh, there's a way you can draw attention to yourself. I mean, everybody is in this business because they're a little bit full of themselves and want to be the center of attention. Hopefully not too much where it becomes like, you know, your downfall, but just enough to keep you going for a long time. And I think that when we saw that people re responded, not just to us individually, but us together, there was some dynamic that they were observing. Uh, and then we began to learn what it was that was appealing about that and be able to package that in a way that was entertaining to an audience, but also fun for us to do for a very, very long time. You know, you've been at this since the beginning, but even before that, you both had other careers, both engineers. How did you go from your, you know, more analytical scientific jobs to be like, you know what, let's bring the band back together and do this crazy YouTube thing, which was back then very crazy and pioneering. What was that spark that got you back into, got you into show business like this? I think that the engineering aspects of our brains helped us tenaciously approach digital media at every turn. I mean, it was, it's, we always talked about it and still talk about it as kind of the wild west, the frontier. There are, everybody's figuring it out. You don't know exactly what the rules are. You certainly don't know how to make money. You, you, you have to figure it out. So um, we've, we've been using the barter system for, um, yeah, almost 20 years now. Uh, what are you trading with me? Well, we we Shirts. trade we trade we trade with other people. I guess we, got, we, we pretty much have the same shirt on, but that's only because when we showed up, they gave us the shirts, and it's different shades of delicate shades of blue. Very nice. Yeah. Well, and I think you know to the engineering point, um, it's funny because when you are a creator, you're not just in the business of creating; you're also in the business of analytics, right? 
because the way that we analyze what we do is through this incredible data that these platforms like YouTube provide. And you don't want to read too much into that because it can become this endless chasing of the algorithm and trying to anticipate what the system is going to reward. But if you don't do that, at least to some level, and you just try to embrace the pure artistry of just being a creator, a lot of times you'll end up doing something that doesn't feed into the algorithm at all. And so I think that there's just been this, this balance between you know, the left brain and right brain of there is a there's an artist you know inside the two of us and we want to do things that are creative and original and innovative uh, to us but we also want to do something that's practical that actually connects with an audience that you can build a brand around so i think that that's where the analytical side enters the process in terms of that balance is very interesting because yes you want to create you want to be original but at the same time whether it's trends or algorithms you need to kind of be in the zeitgeist or on that bad wagon. So how do you kind of find like, okay, this is, we're putting our retinal link, you know, stamp on this, but you also have to kind of ride that wave. How do you go about that? We still start with what we want to put out into the world. You know, how we want to express ourselves. We, we know that we're, we we'll put our best foot forward. We know we're good at talking to each other. We've always done a lot of that. At a certain point, we realize, let's stop talking to each other unless we're on camera. <laughs> I mean, uh, not to that extreme. We don't, we don't, as soon as this camera shuts off, we won't speak to each other for the rest of the day. Yeah. Uh, we'll blame either one of you. So it's, it's yeah, right. It's, I mean, 38 years of friendship. It's, we're like an old married couple. You know, we, there's not a lot that's left unsaid, but we still find a lot of things to say. My point is... What's your point? When we, okay. we were good at talking to each other, and we also wanted to set this challenge artistically to say, okay, we're not going to do a bunch of jump cuts. Mm. And so we were, when we were formulating Good Mythical Morning as a format, we put those two things together and it fed into the algorithm where YouTube was incentivizing longer watch time. And that was actually unintentional. The reason that we ended up not doing jump cuts is because we didn't want to have to edit the video. Because in the early days when we started Good Mythical Morning, we would show up, we would record the conversation and we would turn around, edit it and post it. Really sort of a precursor show to Good Mythical Morning called Good Morning Chia Lincoln, but that's a story for another time. A story for <laughs> another time. But it's not Forbes worthy. We, the idea being that we've always done things with this practical approach. Be like, how do you get a video up every single day? Well, you can't overthink it and you can't spend too much time editing it. So you know what? We won't edit it. It'll just be an uncut conversation. And it forced us into this place where we had to be able to fill the air you know, without awkward pauses or cuts or, you know, different camera angles. And then we stumbled into what the, the algorithm was rewarding at the time with YouTube suddenly being very interested in the number of minutes that a person would spend in a session. And so all of a sudden we just found our videos were being served up one after another. And it, this, what we considered a side project as Good Mythical Morning eclipsed our original YouTube channel very quickly. Uh, in terms of just daily audience. Real quick, give me the background story of when you decided to just start making YouTube videos. So we had been making videos as like on the side, right? Because we didn't know what we were gonna do with this comedy thing. We would get together one night a week. We would write songs. That was a big part of the original thing was just, you know, writing funny songs And you still work in day jobs at this point. Yes. Yeah. And this is five years before YouTube existed. Yeah. We, we were engineers at the time. But what we would do is we would upload the videos to a website, redlink.com. And people would ask us, they would say, uh, why don't you guys have a YouTube? Once YouTube came out in 2005, they were like, why don't you guys have YouTube? We were like, well, and it was a YouTube at the time. Why don't you have a YouTube? Well, we don't need a YouTube because we have a website, right? But then oh. when people literally took our videos from our website, downloaded them and re-uploaded them to YouTube without our permission, and they got more views than we got in a year, in like a, a week, you know, we were like, we should do that intentionally. And that was when we began creating videos on purpose for YouTube. And then around 2006, 2007 is when we said, I think we can support ourselves in doing this by talking brands into being in our videos. Is there a can you think back on one video that really caught on and kind of sparked a breakthrough for you guys? We wrote a song about Facebook and uploaded it to YouTube. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah. But then Facebook 
launched a thing called The Wall where you could embed a video. And so our Facebook song went viral on Facebook and then we started getting contacted by marketing agencies to, because everyone was trying to figure out, okay, how do brands get involved in this medium? These guys have figured it out. Uh, of course, that's what we told them. Yeah, we, we found brands that were small and new and willing to experiment and wanted to get involved in the online thing and just wrote the agreements ourselves and talked them into these CPM deals that we were just kind of like reading on the internet. And it's so in the early stages of trying to figure out how you went about this. And so we just kind of invented a system that we were like, I don't know, how much should we charge for this? Let's see what we can charge for it. We were very motivated to develop a business model because we each had kids yeah. already. And so we wanted to be able to buy groceries. So we encourage all young creators to have children. Uh, <laughs> that's really, that's, yeah. that's the business. That's the yeah, yeah, yeah. But speaking business model, how do you guys make money today? Fast forward, going from the old days to now, what is the, you know, it's gone beyond videos to a brand to you are a media enterprise. How does that enterprise make money? Ad revenue, merchandising, uh, paid fan club, and then we pursue all different types of distribution opportunities. We just launched a 24 hours a day, seven days a week, mythical channel on Roku. We developed an, an, we've put out enough content that we can power our own cable channel, basically. The core of the business is still ads, right? You know, so once the, the YouTube partner program started, that has always been, you know, the core for the foundation, the biggest piece of the pie. Over the past 15 years, uh, th that number has gotten larger, mm -hmm. but the, the size of the piece of that pie has gotten smaller in relation to all the other business lines that we've created. Um, and at this point, there's, you know, there's still, there's different forms of ad revenue because there's brand integrations, there's direct integrations, that kind of thing. Um, but I would say that, you know, our, our merch business has, back when we first started like selling a t-shirt, you know, we would be like, I don't know, how many, how many t-shirts can you sell? Like different actual t-shirts can you use, not individual units, but just like a SKU. How many SKUs can you sell to a fan base in a year? We'd be like, I don't know, maybe we should do like a new t-shirt every quarter. I, I think at this point we're launching five to six SKUs every week. Uh, at mythical.com. All, all t-shirts or, or uh, every, just all kinds of products. If you, you know? can, if you can dream it, we can sell it. And as long as our audience is along for the ride and, and there's, it's a, it's fun. It's fun to, we sold shoes over a decade ago. We've got we, uh, lip balm, uh, beard oil, uh, pomade, lotion, cologne, a, a musical cone that you can play. We've had a, a puzzle, uh, <laughs> A shower curtain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, do you guys decide this? Or do you have like a uh, marketer who's like, I, let's, this, I have a great idea for you all. So this is all internal team okay. at this point. So we have an incredible merch team uh, that in a design team, they're constantly developing new concepts. And also, you know, a big part of it is just driven by surveying our fans and asking the mythical beasts what they want. You know, what do they want to see? What, what, you know, you're, you're kind of reading the tea leaves a little bit to see what kinds of patterns and the products that they respond tea to. Tea leaves, we should sell those. We could probably, <laughs> yeah, we, don't put it past us, we will have tea at some point. Yeah, yeah. And we've got a great tea, I mean, we've got over a hundred employees working with us out of our studio in Burbank. So it's, you know, we learn to um, empower people to do things who can do them better than we can. Yeah. And I think that was a big key in terms of growing our studio um, and being able to branch out and say, you know what, here's, a, here's another way, not just to make money, but another way to reach our audience, to deepen that relationship. That's amazing that, you know, a decade ago, you were engineers moonlighting, making videos, and now you're running a 100 person plus Burbank media studio. How do you make that jump both like lifestyle wise from moonlighting to moguls? How do you get into that? Um, How do you teach yourself to build that? Write that down. Moonlight. Moonlight into moguls. Yes. Um, you can sell that too. I think that will. It's been so iterative, right? Uh, thankfully, there wasn't one moment, one viral moment, or one video that was the thing that suddenly brought us into people's co consciousness. It was we would have something that would sort of 
ping and, and hit a little bit. And then we would, and it wasn't always the same thing. It was a different genre, right? You know, in the early days, it was the music videos and then it was the sketches. And then we did local commercials that got a lot of traction. And actually it was the reason that we moved out of California was to make a television show around that. And then we started doing Good Mythical Morning. And little by little, it's been hiring people with like, we have an idea and we're like, well, we need help in order to do that. And so you hire the team to do that. And then you're just like, well, now we need to add this on. Well, let's hire the team to do that. And the next thing you know, you've got this, you're a corporation, right? And you find yourself never really having called yourself a CEO, realizing that you're, you're these co-CEOs of this company. And yet you, you want to be a creator, but you realize you've got to lead this team at the same time. You've got to delegate responsibility, you've got to find the right people to do the right things. So I just think that there are times when we sit back and, you know, you might walk into the studio and be like, ah, I think this, that must be one of the new interns. I should probably introduce myself, yeah. right? How, how many weeks have they been here? I, I feel bad that I haven't introduced myself yet. Uh, but that's a sign that we've got, should. A, we've got a, they're all great. And I know them very well. We've got a great team that's it created this, uh, incredible mythical machine that we can actually take a step back, focus on creating at the same time. But it wasn't an overnight thing. It was so iterative and building it piece by piece that it was, there was never this moment where it was like, oh, things are different. Yet looking back ret retrospectively, it's different. And I think the m main key is listening to our audience. They told us what was valuable to them. And we began to realize what mythical represented in their lives after they did in a lot of ways. We started to realize that mythical is a place where comedy and curiosity create meaningful community, a place where they feel like they belong. They know us, they trust us, they're a part of our friend group. That's something we learned from them. So it's not something, so we didn't cash in, we, uh, we just, we built around it together. And talking about building and community, you're uh, you, with the many lines of business, but you're also investing in in the space, in creators and studios. Tell me about how how that um, you kind of your investment division came up, and what is like what's the latest, what's going on? We launched a program called the Mythical Creator Accelerator, where we invest in up and coming creators that meet certain criteria. We own a piece of their business and then we work alongside them to help them grow that. Learning from everything that we built at Mythical, now kind of in giving them every, everything in our toolkit. We and wanted to invest, you know, we've been successful. We've got, uh, you know, we, we've had great profits at, in, at Mythical and we wanted to be wise with that and reinvest in the ideas that we had, but also we're like, why not invest in the industry that you understand the best, which is the creator economy and seeing that there are so many creators out there who are they're embarking on their career and they're starting out and they're about to answer this long list of questions and across all these bridges to try to create a brand for themselves and these are all questions that we've answered and all bridges that we've crossed over the past decade plus plus. and we didn't have anybody to emulate yeah when we were doing it so hey we've got this playbook that we can just offer to a creator and also make a great financial investment. So by you know giving them uh, some cash to get some equity back, they can begin to build out a team. They can begin to take those steps to build a brand around themselves. And then we can watch that grow and benefit from it as well. And not burn out in the process. Do you reach out to them? Do they apply to you? Are you looking to have you know a, a diverse portfolio? Like, oh, this person's big on this platform, this person is into food, this person is a comedian, this person is into education. Like, how do you build that portfolio of personalities? It's all outbound right now, right? So we're, we're looking at, uh, we're constantly evaluating creators and, and, and reaching out to people who, you know, we wanna make sure that they've already demonstrated that they can build an audience on their own. Like they've got something that people are attracted to. And then once we sit on a talk to them, we find out, hey, do you want to build something bigger than yourself? Do you need a team? Do you, do you have these needs uh, to build something around yourself? 
Uh, or do you just want to keep being a creator and just do, a lot of creators would be like, I want to keep doing the editing, this part, I find joy in that, I want to keep this thing small. We're like, okay, well, we're, this is probably not a great partnership. Mm. But if you want to build a team and you want to build a brand, maybe build a legacy that at one point, maybe in the future, you could step back and it still would exist beyond you, then we know how to do that. And we're, look, we're looking to diversify across a number of verticals. I mean, we started in musical comedy, then we moved to commentary and now to home decor design. How many followers and fans do you have right now across the whole, across the that's a, landscape? That's a good question. We entrust that to other people. Gotcha. So that we can stay focused on the right things. So if we, and you know, a zillion, man. <laughs> we got a zillion people. We have a massive influential platform. When, you, when brands come to collaborate, how do you decide that this is a, this brand fits with our brand. What do you look for in, in doing these deals with you know outside companies to pitch, cross promote, you name it? In a lot of ways, it works itself out because uh, a brand will take a look at our audience, our, our, our demographic, and who we reach, which incidentally is very broad, right? I mean, I would say that you know 18 to 34 is kind of our bread and butter, but we have people younger than that, and we have a lot of people older than that. So very, very broad audience. When we meet, you know, you meet a family, uh, you know when you're out and about and you're like, I don't know if the teenage son or the dad or the mom is a bigger fan. So I think we might do something that, oh, well, this product appeals to dads like us or this product, this is a, more of like, you know, teens getting started out who need a checking account or something like that. So I think that we're not gonna do a, a, a brand and not work with a brand that we don't believe in or we think is doing something unethical or doesn't make sense in terms of this is a product or a service that our fans could use, but because the content, we have so much content, we have so many opportunities for integrations, and we have such a broad audience, that actually we find ways to work with a lot of different brands, and we actually like to use a brand's identity and their message as inspiration for creative mm -hmm. at times. What is the secret of building a massive loyal audience? I really do think it's listening to them and understanding what benefit they're receiving. You know, I mean, the letters. I mean, it, as old school as it sounds, even the letters, someone who takes the time to write a letter about how they were in the hospital going through a certain type of treatment and the constant daily uh, in release of, on our show. Well, that sounded weird. Yeah, constant release daily release, release on our show. Yeah. You said it though. The fact that they could watch Good Mythical Morning every day, it became comfort viewing for them. So we started to realize, oh, that's, this is a service we're providing. This is the way that our friendship connects with people. And I think there's a balance between the listening to the audience and the innovating and doing the thing that you want to do as an original creator, mm -hmm. right? So you have to do something that is true to your vision and make the kind of content that you wish somebody else would have made. And then once an audience begins to connect with it, they're gonna be, you know, essentially our network executive is our audience. And so when you, when you make a television show, which we've, we've done a few of those, and honestly, it's not as great of a process as just making content for an audience. Um, but in the way that you take into account their notes and their POV, I think that we do that with our audience. And so you're not just creating in a vacuum, you are creating for this audience that's giving you constant feedback. But the starting point is not anticipating what they want, but making the thing that you wanna make and then letting them shape it. And I think finding that balance as a creator is a, is a way to have a loyal audience that doesn't feel like you're just sitting there doing exactly what they want. You're surprising them, you're, you're creating new things, but there's a, there's a conversation that they feel like they're a part of. You mentioned before, I want to flip it on the brand side, from the brand perspective, and you mentioned that you, know, you have a very broad audience base, which is great. A lot of creators have very specific niches. If you're a, if an outside company, an outside brand, what must they think about before partnering with a specific creator in terms of authenticity, right match? Like, What should these companies be thinking before they write a big check to a creator to you know, vouch for their brands? I think that a big part of it is a brand wants to know that whatever the content is, whatever the integration is, makes them look better, right? Uh, which 
frankly, is not the easiest thing to navigate with the creator economy, right? You're, you're not dealing with um, networks and companies. You're dealing with individuals that might be going through like a mental health crisis, right? And they may decide that, well, I can't even make the video that, that you wanted me to make. Uh, and so I think that it's, it's a difficult thing to navigate. I think the way that, that, that we've set it up at Mythical is you are dealing with a brand, you're dealing with a team, you're dealing with a show that has a schedule. It's a reliable machine that you can, you're not gonna be embarrassed by the way that the content is integrated. You're gonna get exactly what you paid for. Um, but I think that that's what, you know, does the audience make sense to, for the brand? And is the content gonna be something that they're happy to be associated with? How do you balance serving your fans and delivering what they want, but then also serving your business and what the money side needs? How do you work out that balance? We've always talked about how brands enable us to elevate our content and our audience's experience. So we would create spaces, whether that's on our podcast or within the integration itself, or in an interview to take the opportunity to educate our audience that this is a win-win. So I, th I think that's part of it. I think, I think another part of it is, you know, when you move beyond integrations to the things that we actually sell to our audience. And like I said earlier, you know, we sell a lot of things to our audience, all these SKUs. And then we've got our mythical society where people are paying a monthly fee to be a part of um, this community that gets exclusive content, they get uh, exclusive collectible items that come out every quarter and access to a lot of different things. For us, we're trying to make sure that every uh, touch point where a fan can spend money, they're actually receiving something of real value to them, right? We won't ever get close to doing something that is some like exploiting our audience for a quick buck, right? Like we, because we know that, hey, next year we're gonna be coming back to you with another thing that we're offering. And your experience this year is going to determine your likelihood to pay for another experience next year. And that's why we haven't, for example, jumped on the crypto bandwagon. You know, when that was really starting to take off, there were just so many ideas, but it wasn't clear to us what the value to our audience was. So we said, you know what? We don't need to be on the front lines of this and we can learn and make a calculated decision on their behalf and we like down to, the road. You know, we like to wait, actually, you know, even there was an initial wave of creators writing books. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were really bad, <laughs> right? But they sold well yeah. because the audience is, oh, I get a book from this creator. We sat back and we, we like to watch the first wave of something and see what lessons we can learn. And then we say, okay, well, when we entered this space, when we publish our first book, which was the book of mythicality, which I don't even know what year that was now, um, we want that to be something that when people take it, open it up and hold it in their hands, it's, it, it feels valuable, right? It feels like it actually captures what we were trying to put on the page. And it's, an, it's something they can experience um, and, and, and feel the value of. And so I think that that's, that's what we do. We try to be very sensitive to ever saying yes to something that is very clearly just finding a way to make money from your audience. Is there a one dream person that you could collaborate with. We really want to work with Lionel Richie. I mean, <laughs> and here's the thing: he knows this. We, I don't. And think let me Lionel just tell, let me nervous. let me tell you the things that we have done. Right. So back in college, we did Project Lionel, where we got everyone who came into our dorm room for a year to get, sit down on our couch and do the Lionel pose from his self-titled album, right under the fold-out album, right above our couch. So this is an old, this is a dream going it's, way back. Yeah, yeah. But, but then we've done Project Lionel on tour before where we get people up there and we, and we grade their Lionel pose. We've done... Every guest that comes on Good Mythical Morning does the Lionel pose on our couch. Oh, you want to do it right now? Uh, this is too short of a couch. Just get up. You can do it. I can do it. Stand behind the couch. Right, see the pose. You can, be the, you can be the poster in the back. Because, yeah, in our dorm room, the, the album was on the wall and then said, hey, I, don't, I want to have a record of you. Being, and then, so the foot comes up under here. I need to have a white pants. Yes, next shoot. And then, okay, and then the thumbs have to touch. This has to be a right angle. And then it's just one of these. 
And then this is Lionel's, Lionel's, Lionel. Lionel, your official invite to your Forbes. Well, no, you listen, listen. He's Lionel, been invited. come on. In fact, let me tell you right come now. Come on, Lionel. Lionel is friends with Sugar Ray Leonard, and Sugar Ray was on the show and uh, saw all the Lionel poses and was like, I'm going to text Lionel right now. He said they're texting Lionel. And then we sang. He's, hard, he's playing hard to get. We I sang thought, all night long. Lionel's famous song, All Night Long, literally all night long for 11 hours. We sang that song and recorded ourselves singing that song. And I don't know, apparently he's too busy. So Lionel Richie, that's, that's, my, that's my dream collaboration. I guess I'll have to ask why. You definitely showed me <laughs> why. And you guys mentioned legacy before. What is the legacy of Rhett and Lenka, everything and mythical and everything you've put together? What, what, what is your dream for this? What we call mythicality, which is, as Link stated, it's this curiosity and creativity that builds community. We want to have a community of people who have, who have gathered around these things that we've created and kind of created their own momentum, you know, and we've got other people at Mythical who are creating their own content that we may have been involved in the initial stages, but like, you know, we've got Mythical Kitchen and they've got their their mythical kitchen universe that they are developing and they've got their own fans. I just think that this mythical enterprise that we have started where people are making content that is true to themselves, that is building this community uh, you know, around itself, uh, we would just like to believe that that could live on beyond us, you know, and inspire other creators to, to make content that is true to themselves, but also gathers uh, a community or, uh, around it. Yeah, I would say, I think our legacy is the power of friendship. You know, I think that uh, it brings comfort and, uh, you know, there's, there's few things more powerful than a good hearted laugh shared with friends. And that's the energy that we're putting out into the world. And I'm proud of it. This Rhett and Link Corporation has been going on since first grade <laughs> and through college. You guys are roommates in college too. Which yeah. Is yeah. Like, with all those years together and running this company that's ballooned into a hundred person, you know, studio. How do you get along? How do you roll through disputes, disagreements, differences of creative opinion, business opinion? How has that worked out for you? 30 mud, mud wrestling. Mud wrestling? Yeah. 38 years of friendship is a long time and yeah when you build your whole company and your brand around that it's we've learned that you got to invest in the relationship did you skip out here because i've been i've been friends with you for 39 years oh really yeah it took it might just stop it took it you a little bit it might just felt longer <laughs> <laughs> stay out of this <laughs> yeah we have um we are committed to communicating through our issues right and there are issues you know we, we have created differences we get on each other's nerves when you're when you work in the same office with with someone that, for that hurts my feelings for, for you say that. however many years it's been i mean originally our desks were facing each other then they were side by side and now they're on opposite sides of the office facing away which but they're you know, still in the same room but we, yeah, we haven't we haven't separated yes. yet i think it's constant communication right it's we don't ever let, I mean, sometimes it'll be like, okay, maybe a couple of weeks have gone by and we haven't aired something out that needs to be aired out. But I think there's just a commitment to the friendship. If the, if the friendship is the core of our business, right? And so if it becomes too much about the business partnership and not enough about the friendship, then it can begin to kind of crumble from the inside. So I think there's just attention paid to the communication and making sure that we talk through our difficulties and our challenges in the same way that you would do in, a, in any relationship. Yeah. I love this guy no matter what, but he better not test me on it. What do you mean test you? I don't know. The things that you can do? You mean like run to the edge of like a... Of our relationship. Of a canyon and then be like, I'm about to jump. Are you going to catch me? What advice would you give folks looking to get into the creator game right now or people just starting out? I think you have to learn how to do two things. You have to learn how to trust others with the right things and trust yourself with the right things. Uh, and you can't lean too heavily in either direction, right? If you only trust yourself, 
you're going to burn out very, very quickly. And if you only trust others, I know they get it. Don't tell them too much. I don't want to make any more complicated. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> it's about trust.